and the Ratchet, for once powers had been given to Brussels by the member state, they could never be returned. Initially, I thought, like everybody else, that uh, we had joined a common market and what could be nicer and more friendly and sensible and economically wise to do. But since then, in 1975, when we had the vote to remain in that, so we were told, um, it's become one or two things further than just a common market. It then became, a few years later, a European economic community, then a European community. It's now the European Union with all sorts of controls and restrictions, regulations, and we're fast approaching via this new constitution something that the French have already named potentially a United States of Europe. And I'm not at all sure that that's what I and many others voted to join back in 1975. So in 1975 we signed up for a social trade, trade agreement and we've let, it's the people who've let the government, successive governments, um, vote, gradually vote away our democratic rights. Um, this government has no right to sign us up to the constitution without the will of the people. But we need the will of the people to stop it. It's no use coming down in five years' time, we've signed up to it, we can't get out of it, and the people say, well, we don't want it. It's up to the people of the day to say no. This is the Strasbourg Parliament. It was built in 1999 at a cost of 300 million pounds. It is open for only four days every month. What happens at the end of that four days is we load our offices into tin boxes and then lorries arrive downstairs and drive the whole lot nearly 300 miles up to Brussels where the boxes are unpacked for the next three weeks when we're supposed to be there and then it's all brought back again. This whole process of shifting the administration of the staff from one home to another is costing the European taxpayer over 100 million euros a year. It is the biggest scam in human history. We're not talking about billions of pounds, we're talking about trillions of pounds. Why a country which has been independent for 900 or more years would ever wish to involve itself in such political chicanery and nonsense as something which defies anyone who is sane. And only now have we got just about 14 or 15 months before they rivet on us a pan-European constitution which would be superior to our own splendid constitution, one which is the pride of the world and pioneered the way for sensible living. And here we are giving it all away. The political aim is to um, develop the framework for a, a real European Union constitution and uh, in my opinion this means building up a uh, European federal state. In black and white the draft constitution wording confirms Brussels will exercise competence and primacy over member states own laws. For the British this will mean being stripped of any remaining independence losing control over our foreign policy and armed forces, the handing over of our legal system and law enforcement to the European Union, the scrapping of the pound sterling to be replaced by the euro, the handing over of our remaining currency and gold reserves to the European Central Bank, and the total regulation of British domestic and international trade by the European Union. Coincidentally or otherwise, the European goal of dominating Britain unfinished business going back centuries will have been accomplished. Most have already noticed that the job of running Britain is increasingly being carried out in Brussels not by British politicians but by unaccountable foreign committees most in this country have never even heard of, let alone voted into power. These unelected, inscrutable forums dictate what citizens across the Eurozone can and can't do, down to the last detail. Henceforth, Britain is to be ruled from the new Europe, by the new Europe, and for the benefit of the new Europe. The powers driving this new superstate have always been, indeed as they are today, 
France and Germany. Lindsay Jenkins worked as a senior civil servant in the British Ministry of Defence for almost 10 years and spent a further 10 working for British and American investment banks in the City of London. She is the author of two books exposing the origins of European federalism and the emergence of the European Union. Today, over 80%, that is 80% of everything that goes through the House of Commons and the House of Lords merely rubber stamps Brussels. And there is an awful lot of it. We have recently celebrated, if that is the right word, our 40,000th directive from Brussels. And having attacked central government, now Brussels is attacking our local government structure. So we have lost, just to recap, in the following areas, we have lost 100% of our control, or near enough, over the environment, the British scenery, countryside, everything that comprises environment, including health and safety regulations, absolutely everything. We have lost near enough 100% control over our fishing. We have lost 100% control over our farming. And we have lost 100% control over our trade policy. And that last is of particular significance when you consider that Britain is the fourth largest economy in the world and we do more trade per head of population than any other country in the world by far. For many in this country, the first experience they have had with the European Union, apart from VAT, came when they tried to protest new legislation introduced to limit the amount and availability of vitamins, herbs and alternative remedies people will be able to purchase and use in the future. The UK has always enjoyed a, a very open market. Uh, products have been allowed uh, on the market if they're safe, period. There's not been any uh, restrictions on the dosage or the type of product so long as it's safe and poses no risk to public health. The European Directive on Food Supplements changes that completely and we're going to lose over 300 different nutrient forms. On top of that there's going to be dosage restrictions so the 1000 milligram vitamin C tablet that we've been selling for 40-50 years that also will become illegal. So the safe and effective products that we've been used to in this country for decades are going to be illegal for no other reason than Europe wants to harmonize legislation. We are one of three countries with an open market in food supplements. We're going to lose our products by the 1st of August 2005. Uh, I'm Dr. Paul Lehman. I work in a clinic using natural therapies to treat people and I regard any restriction of vitamin and mineral um, uh, production and availability as being very serious and can damage people. Uh, we, we use um, huge numbers of supplements for our patients that uh, we feel very definitely need it and uh, they respond very well with them. Most people in Britain today believe that the European Parliament works in a similar way to Westminster. So many thousands of British citizens have written to their MPs and MEPs protesting these and other directives. But do MEPs actually have the power to change the food supplements and herbal directives or indeed anything. So what are MEPs for? Well I'll tell you. MEPs are here to vote and to vote often and to vote regularly. Sometimes we vote up to 450 times in the space of 80 minutes. Now I have to confess, hands up, I don't know what's going on half the time. I haven't even read all of the documents, so massive are they? Now it could be that my fellow MEPs down there are all Albert Einsteins and all absolutely understand what's going on. But I suspect that's not the case. In fact, it's rather like paying monkeys because what happens is the civil servants draw up the list and if it's vote number 58 and the piece of paper says vote yes, you vote yes. And if it's number 59 and it says vote no, you vote no. It is an absolute farce. It is a complete sham masquerading as democracy. 
In 15 minutes' time, we have to go down to the European Parliament and to fulfil our function as members of the European Parliament, which means we have to vote. So what we're about to do now is, with our assistants, who've done a massive amount of reading and work behind the scenes, they are effectively going to tell us what to do. Oh, look how many votes there are. What have we got? Yeah. There's, yeah. So there's about, in fact, there's a, now look at that. This, yeah. this, this is a classic example of EU voting. There we have 40 individual different amendments that we're expected to vote for on block. Now, I defy any man or woman down in that chamber to understand all those 40 amendments and make a balanced decision. It's just impossible. Laws of the European Union are drafted not by the Euro Parliament, but by the EU Commission, one of three powerful forums in which the true might of the Union resides.